Uh, I'm going to present a result concerning these objects called uh, affine delaying Lustig varieties. So these are uh, also, also, before I start, ev everything I'm going to say is joint work with Yi Hangzhou. Um, so these objects naturally arise in the study of Shimura varieties, and their irreducible components actually give rise to very interesting algebraic cycles on the special fiber of Shimura varieties. So to sort of explain how these objects arise in Shimura varieties, I'm going to start off with a, with a motivating example. Uh, which is the case of a of modular curve. Um, so I'm going to let p be a prime, uh, and n at least 3 an integer, uh, which is co-prime to p. Then I can consider the uh, modular curve uh, x0 n uh, of level gamma 0 n. So just remind you, this uh, classifies uh, pairs of uh, elliptic curves. <laughs> Together with um, a cyclic subgroup uh, C of order n. Okay. So, you can show that this moduli functor is actually defined or well defined over Zp, and this, this guy is actually a smooth scheme over Z uh, localized at p. And then in this case, we have uh, a certain distinguished subspace of the special fiber of x0 n called the super singular locus. So this is the locus where the Haas invariant vanishes, and it has the following description. So it's just it's a zero-dimensional subvariety, and its points are uh, can be described in the following way. So it's a, a certain double quotient like so, where this D is the quaternion algebra of a Q ramified at p and infinity. And this uh, kp in gl2 or the finite intervals away from p is a, is a compact open. And this compact open is related to this gamma null n subgroup. So the idea behind this description is that uh, you, you show that all super singular curves are actually isogenous. And then this description is just a description of the isogeny class. So <coughs> then this part on the right here classifies the prime to p part of the isogeny class. And so essentially what you're doing is you're just counting certain lattices in the Tate module. And then this d cross is the group of self-isogenies of a super singular elliptic curve. And then this x mu b here classifies the p power part of the isogeny class. And this is really the most interesting term, which I'm going to uh, talk about. So uh, to to find this object, I need to introduce some notation. So L will be the fraction field of the VIT vectors uh, over FP bar. Uh, and OL, its ring of integers. And I'll let sigma acting on L be the Frobenius. OK. Then uh, this B in the statement is the element of GL2 given by the matrix 0, P, 1, 0. And this mu is a co-character of GL2 given by sending T to the diagonal matrix T, 0, 0, 1. Okay. And then uh, you can define this x mu b. So this is an example of an affine de lean Lustig variety. So it's defined by this, the set uh, GL2L mod GL2OL such that G inverse B sigma G lies in a double coset of GL2OL corresponding to mu P. Okay, so if you haven't seen this definition before, it may seem like a little bit opaque, but it turns out this has, actually has a very concrete description in terms of Dunay theory. So you can actually identify it. It's in bijection with um, the set of due to name modules 
uh, in the isocrystal L squared B sigma. So this L2 is a two dimensional vector space on which B sigma acts via a semi linear automorphism. And this is just like, this is just the definition of an isocrystal. And in fact, it's the isocrystal associated to a super singular elliptic curve. Okay? And then you can show that this, this set GL2O, GL2L mod GL2OL is identified with a set of lattices in this, in this two dimensional vector space. And then this condition that G inverse B sigma G lies in this double coset is a condition on the lattice and the Frobenius applied to this lattice. And the condition precisely says that is actually uh, a Dudenay module. And using classical Dudenay theory, you can show that this set actually parameterizes like the set of p power isogenies of the, of the elliptic curve. Okay? And so that's sort of where this description comes from. Um, and in this case, you can show that this x mu b can be identified with, so it's a discrete set. So it's the quotient of d q p cross modulo o d q p cross. So this is the unique compact open in this, this quaternion algebra of a q p. Okay, and then in this case, you can actually recover the sort of the classical description of the super singular locus, which is given by this class set uh, of the quaternion algebra. Okay, so this is the classical description, I think, due to set, and I think it's a really beautiful description because now you have. Basically, it's saying that this distinguished subspace, which is very naturally defined on the special fiber of a modular curve, is actually parameterized by a certain inner form of GL2. Okay? And um, this is interesting arithmetic consequences. For example, one thing you could do is study the Arbol Jacobi map from the set of divisors supported on the super singular locus into the Jacobian. And this actually encodes some sort of geometric realization of Jacques A. Langland's correspondence. And is also related to level raising between, between modular forms. So um, I won't say any more about these, these applications. So today I'm really going to focus uh, more on the geometry. So the reason I chose to phrase this description, this description in this way is because it generalizes very easily to higher dimensions. So in general, if you consider a, a Shimura variety, it turns out there's an analog of the super singular locus called the basic locus. And the basic locus has actually a very similar description to, to, this, to, to this. So it's going to look like, again, like a double quotient. But you actually replace the group GL2 with a group G defining the Shimura datum. Okay? So, but what can happen in general is that the super singular or basic locus is actually positive dimensional. So it has some sort of geometry. Okay? And so, so in general, the geometry is actually all encoded in this object x mu b here. So in general, um, this x mu b encodes the geometry of the basic locus of Shimura varieties. So in that sense, the irreducible components of these affine de Lustig varieties will actually, of these x mu b's, will actually give rise to cycles on, on the special fiber of Shimura varieties. And we'll see, actually, you can actually show in general, there's like a very similar description uh, of the irreducible components of the basic locus. It's just going to be given by a certain class set for an inner form of the group. But a subtlety that happens in general is that this class set actually can actually appear with a certain multiplicity. And I'll give an example later on in the talk where this, this multiplicity is actually like non-trivial. So in the case of the modular curve, the, mul the multiplicity is just, is just one. But um, in general, it's, it can be bigger. And the reason one sees this multiplicity it can be explained um, by this uh, Chen Zhu conjecture, which I'll talk. So this is uh, Xinwen Zhu. Uh, and um, so this, this conjecture can be phrased completely in terms of these uh, generalizations of these x mu b's. Okay? So, it turns out these x mu b's can be defined in a much greater generality. So to define them, I'll have to introduce some, some notations. So uh, f will be a local field, and of its its ring of integers. So I'm allowing f to be um, either mixed or equal characteristic. Um, 
And the residue field will be FQ. And pi F will denote a uniformizer. And then I'll let L be the, uh, the completion of the maximal unramified extension of F. Okay? And sigma will act on, uh, so sigma will be the Frobenius automorphism of L over F. Um, Okay. And so to define an affine delin Lustig ready, I need to fix a reductive group. So I'll fix G over OF is a reductive group. Uh, and I'll assume it's split. So this is only for simplicity. So everything I, I'll say makes sense for an arbitrary reductive group over this, over this guy. But um, the notation is just somehow easier if I assume it's split. Uh, And I'll also fix uh, T, a maximal split torus, and B, a Borel in G. OK. And so to define an affine delin Lustig ready, I need to have two parameters, a mu and a B. So this mu is going to be a dominant co-weight of this torus, and uh, B is an element of G of L. Okay. Then I can define this x mu B to be the set G in G of L mod G of OL, such that uh, G inverse B uh, sigma G lies in the double coset of G of OL corresponding to mu of pi f. So this is just a direct generalization of what the definition in the GL2 case. Okay. Um, so this is, this is the affine de Lean Lustig variety in general. Okay. So the remark is that as opposed to the case of GL2 when this was just like a discrete set, now this group, now this, this object actually has some geometric structure. So the remark is um, x mu b is a, so I'll put in brackets, perfect scheme. Um, so the brackets means in mixed characteristic, it's a perfect scheme. In equal characteristic, it's just an actual scheme. Um, but since we're actually only considering like the topological notions, like irreducible components, um, this p taking this, uh, this perfectness is, uh, is not really an issue. Um, oh yeah, by the way, perfect means like the absolute Frobenius is uh, an, an isomorphism. So it's a perfect scheme over f q bar. Okay. And the fact that this is re actually representable is uh, actually quite a difficult theorem, and only known very recently due to work of Xin Wenzhu and Bart Schultze. Okay. Um, but for us, we'll see later on that this representability is actually like a really important. Uh, uh, like a really important result that we'll need. Okay. And secondly, the second remark is that uh, this x mu b, in fact, only depends on the image of b, this element b, in this set bg. So this bg is defined to be the quotient uh, of g of l modulo the equivalence relation, which identifies g with h inverse G sigma h. Okay, and so you can think of BG as basically it's the set of isocrystals with G structure. Okay, so in the case when G equals GLN, it's literally this BG is literally the set of isomorphism classes of isocrystals. Okay, um, and in general, there's an analog of the Dudenay Manning classification. So BG is classified by uh, Two invariants. So it's classified by the map which takes a B to uh, this new B bar, which is known as the Newton point. So this is a dominant rational co weight. Um, so this is called the Newton point. Uh, 
And the so-called Kotwitz point, which is an element in pi 1. So this is the algebraic pi 1 of g with sigma co-invariants. And this is sometimes called the Kotwitz point. Oh, yeah, the group is split, so don't actually need the sigma. OK. Um, yes, so, so this is an analog. This is just an analog of that Jude Neumannic classification. So when g equals gln, this Newton point just gives you the, the Newton polygon. So essentially, uh, in, in that case, it, it literally boils down to the, the, to the Jude Neumannic classification. And actually, for gln, you don't even need this Kotwitz point, but, which, is, which is the analog of the end point of the polygon. But in, in general, you, you do need these, both these invariants. Okay. Um, so it's, there's a well-known, actually a well-known dimension formula for these x mu b's, given in terms of these invariants. So I'll define d to be the dimension of x mu b. So it's actually finite dimensional. And the dimension is given by uh, this mu uh, minus nu b bar. Uh, Paired with rho minus half the defect of b. So this defect is defined. Oh, wait. OK. This defect I'll define in a moment. Uh, I need to introduce some more, some more notation. So this is, this is some number for now. OK. Um, OK. So. Uh, <coughs> so I'll define. So now, the thing we're really interested in, in, in the, for this talk, is the set sigma, which is going to be the set of um, irreducible components uh, in x mu b of this top dimension, top dimension d. So we actually want a formula for like the number of, of irreducible components. But it turns out, in general, this the number of irreducible components is actually infinite, usually. So what we're going to do is actually cut down the, the irreducible components by letting a certain symmetry group act on it. Okay. So I'll define um, this uh, uh, JBF will be the sigma centralizer group. So this is the set of uh, G and G of L such that g inverse b sigma g is equal to b. Okay, so this is, this is called the sigma centralizer group. And this acts, in fact, on uh, x mu b just by left multiplication. So you can see if you have an element of jb, um, and you multiply this g by it on the left, um, it sort of commutes with this, sigma commutes with this b. And then the, this invariance condition is still satisfied. So this JB will act on this x mu b. And this action is algebraic, so it also acts on the set of uh, top dimensional irreducible components. Okay. And the conjecture um, of Chen and Zhu is that. Um, uh, so the conjecture actually gives a formula for the number of orbits of these top dimensional irreducible components of f. And this conjecture says that the number of orbits is equal to the dimension of a certain weight space of a representation. Okay. Um, so, uh, of a so this v mu will be a representation of the dual group of g. So g hat is the Langmans dual group. And um, uh, I'll let t hat be the dual torus. Then uh, v mu is the uh, is the g is the g hat representation of highest weight mu. And lambda b, uh, yeah, so. Got to mention. So mu, um, we defined was a co-weight of t, and since t hat is the dual torus, this is just the same as the set of weights of, of t hat. Okay, so 
That's how you get this representation. And this lambda b will be a certain weight, uh, which there's a, there's a sort of a concrete definition, which is quite technical. But the way you want to think about this lambda b is that it's the, it's the best integral approximation. to um, new b bar. OK, so uh, this new b bar I define as a, as a rational co-weight, so we've tensored by q. So this lambda b is just the, um, it's just the integral co-weight which best approximates it. Okay. And then this guy, v mu lambda b, is just the weight space for lambda b. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, sorry, that's. So how, how do you count? When you, do you count weights? Or? Oh, for, no, for, for this, there's no, there's, we don't use any weights. It's just literally the number of orbits. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is, this is the conjecture. Oh, yeah. So now I can actually define what this defect is. Um, so it turns out this. JB of F actually arises as the F points of a reductive group over F. And this, uh, this defect uh, is actually just equal to uh, the difference between the ranks of G and the rank of JB. Okay. Um, so for example, in, um, in, in the GL2 case, this, this sigma centralizer group is just the quaternion algebra over, over QP. Okay. Um, okay. So now I'll mention some uh, previous works towards this conjecture. So I think the uh, First people to cons really consider this conjecture in general was uh, Xiaon Zhu, who proved the case when this defect is actually equal to zero. Okay, and they use this to prove certain cases of uh, the Tate conjecture for Shimura varieties, and I think. Oh, Shimon can correct me if I'm wrong. I think this this taken conjecture was somehow maybe the motivation for this for this conjecture. So the point is um, uh, under this assumption that def G B equals zero, the basic locus in the Shimura variety is actually in half the dimension of the Shimura variety. So um, they actually form candidates to generate the take classes in the middle cohomology of Shimura varieties. Okay. And then you can use the description of the cohomology of the Shimura variety to actually predict what the take classes look like. And then when you do that, you really see this multiplicity appearing. Okay. Um, so I guess that's, that was part of the motiv motivation behind this conjecture. But it, in general, this, this defect can be very large. So this is, this is just a special case. Uh, yes, I will do an example in like a minute. Okay. Um, <coughs> so actually, it, it basically never happens when the group is split. Uh, yeah, but it, it does happen in general. Um, uh, okay, and so there was some work last year due to Hamaku and Veeman who proved the case when mu is minuscule and also g split. Uh, sorry. Yeah, g split. So this conjecture actually makes sense in more generality. So they, only, they, they did the split case. And then near very recently, I think maybe just a, a month or two ago, um, proved the case when mu is a uh, sum of dominant minuscule uh, co-weights. So in particular, in a type A case, all co-weights are uh, a sum of dominant minuscule co-weights. So he actually did the case uh, of type A when the group is of type A. Um, but in general, 
uh, not every uh, coweight is going to be a sum of minuscule dominant coweights. Um, so uh, what we did is the following. So we showed that this conjecture uh, holds uh, for all G mu B. Okay. So before I talk about the idea of the proof, I'm going to answer Chris's question and give you an example of uh, one of these defect equals zero cases. So uh, the example I'm going to consider uh, is the case of a Hilbert modular surface. So I'm going to let E over Q be uh, totally real. Uh, degree 2. And I'm going to assume p is inert in E. Then I'll consider the Hilbert modular surface, which I'll write y naught n. So this is a moduli space for abelian surfaces with um, multiplication by the ring of integers of E plus level structure and, and polarization. And then you can show it's also defined, this moduli functor is defined over z localized at p. And then in this case, uh, this y0n, uh, that you can also consider the super singular locus in the this, in this special fiber. And in this case, there's actually some geometry. So it's positive dimensional. And you can actually show it's. The super single locus is given by two families, y1 and y2, where each yi is a p1 vibration um, over this discrete Shimura set or, or class set for this uh, quaternion algebra d prime. So d prime is the quaternion algebra over E, which is ramified at the uh, two infinite places, infinity 1 and infinity 2. OK. So in this case, you see that the components in the super singular locus are, para are still parameterized by a certain inner form of the group, but it appears with multiplicity 2. OK. And the reason, essentially the reason why this multiplicity comes up is because the number of orbits of JBF on sigma is actually equal to 2 in this case. OK. So even in the case of Shimura values, for when the group is it's actually not split, you, you do see some interesting multiplicity. OK. So. Now I'll start to talk about the idea of the proof. So before I go on, are there, are there any questions? OK. Uh, so, <coughs> so I want to mention, um, in all these previous works, um, they, they all use like a common idea, which is somehow like sort of the only technique we know we, we sort of know how to we uh, sort of the only technique there is to actually understand Alfandelin Lustig values, which is the so-called reduced to the super basic case. Um, so so in the previous works, the idea was to reduce to the so-called super basic case. Uh, so this is essentially when this group G equals GLN. And then in this case, the geometry is somehow uh, manageable. And you can sort of do explicit computations with matrices. Um, but in general, this reduction step is actually really hard. And it can involve very difficult combinatorics. So we do something completely different, uh, which relies on the following. So the following idea, which is that if x is a uh, variety, I, I guess I want to assume it's also quasi projective. Uh, over a finite field, 
um, of dimension d with uh, c irreducible components of dimension d. Then there's the so-called uh, Langve estimate. Or Langve bound, which one you can think of as a very weak form of the Bay conjectures, which says that the the number of f q to the s points on this variety, as s goes to infinity, is asymptotically the same as c times q to the s d. Okay, so it's equal to c times q to the s d plus little o of q to the s d. Okay. So this essentially says that to understand the number of the dimension and the number of irreducible components, it suffices to, to understand the number of f q to the s rational points on this variety. Okay. So before I tell you how we're going to count points on the affine de Lustig variety, I need to introduce um, some notations and assumptions. So I'm going to let s, so s will now be in uh, an integer greater or equal to 1. And for each s, I'll define fs uh, to be the unramified extension of f uh, of degree s. OK. Um, so, and now, so now I'll introduce some sum assumptions. So there's some very standard assumptions in this whole theory of alpha and linguistic varieties, which actually allows us to assume that uh, G is simple and adjoint. And we're also going to assume, in addition, it's not of type A. Which one? G is not of type A. Yeah, this is not, this is not standard. This is very standard. All right, so the reason we assume this is because there's some combinatorial issue which comes up later, but the case of type A is already, is already known, so we don't, we don't need to consider it. But yeah, you're right, it's not standard. Um, you don't deal with it, but it's counting? Uh, it's a, it's a, there's a combinatorial obstruction. So I, I, I think if we just understand the combinatorics better, we could probably do it, yeah. Um, yes. Um, Okay, so uh, we can also assume that B is basic, and um, so, so basic. This basic is the analog for general groups of the super singular case for isocrystals. So in this case, this means that this Newton point is actually trivial, and uh, it means that this also means that this JB is an inner form of G. And finally, we'll assume that B is what's called decent. OK, so this, this implies this decency implies that G is actually in, this, this B is actually in G of F S0, where S0 is some fixed, um, fixed integer. So recall, like B originally was an element of G of L, but this is actually saying it's defined over some, uh, some finite extension of, of F. And this decency, this decency also implies that this um, gamma s, which is the, defined to be the norm of b, is actually equal to 1. And also that this x mu b, which a priori was only defined over f q bar, is defined over f q to the s naught. So it's defined over a finite field, which is, which is what we wanted. Um, so now I can introduce the, the point counting formula. So it turns out. In general, these affine de lustig varieties are uh, not finite type. They're actually only locally a finite type, so that 
there are, in general, there are infinitely many points. Um, so what you actually have to do is sort of count uh, orbits of points instead. And it turns out this counting is naturally given by certain twisted orbital integral. So uh, the proposition is that, is that the analog of the Lang day bound in our situation is the following asymptotic. So this twisted orbital integral is actually equal to the sum over the orbits of irreducible components of q to the sd weighted by a certain volume factor. So this, this is the volume of the, sta of the stabilizer of a certain component. And you can show this is actually an open compact. Okay, so this volume is well defined, uh, plus little o of q to the sd. So I owe you a definition of what this twisted orbital integral is. So this is the following. So this function f mu s is uh, an element of the spherical Hecker algebra. So this is just the uh, Hecker algebra of locally constant um, compactly supported functions on GFS, which are uh, bi-invariant under this hyperspecial uh, compact with values in C. And this element is just the indicator function of the double coset G O F S mu uh, pi F G O F S. Okay. So this sort of twisted orbital integral then is defined to be the integral over this quotient, this GFS over JBF, of this function f mu s evaluated at g inverse b sigma g uh, dg. Okay. And to actually define this, but to actually define this integral, you have to fix some, some Haar measures on these two groups. So on this quotient, we'll just take the, the quotient measure. But on these two groups, uh, we set the Haar measure such that the volume of GOFS, this hyperspecial, is equal to 1. And on JBF, we set the volume, set the Haar measure such that the volume of G of equals 1. So the reason this actually determines the Haar measure on JB, JB of S, is because that these, these two groups are actually inner forms. And in the case when two groups are inner forms, you can canonically transfer a measure from, from, from one group to the other. Okay? Um, so this twisted orbital integral actually is already sort of appears in this whole business of like the langlands kotwitz method when you count points in Shimura varieties. Um, and so this is like a local, sort of a local analog of, of that. Um, OK, uh, so uh, okay. So to actually prove the conjecture, we need to understand two things. Uh, so from this proposition, it turns out we need to understand the asymptotics of uh, this twisted orbital integral. And two, we need to understand um, the volume of a stabilizer of an irreducible component. OK, so somehow the second part is sort of the, the most subtle part of the, the, this, the proof. And so I'll talk a little bit about, about it at the end. Um, but for now, I, I'll talk, I want to uh, sort of discuss the, the first part, so how we compute these, these asymptotics. Okay. Um, so in general, twisted orbital integrals are actually quite difficult to compute. Um, so what we do um, is that use the, we use what's the so-called base change fundamental lemma to convert it into a simpler problem. Okay? So somehow this is, this is the main tool that we're going to use to compute these. So the base change fundamental lemma relates this twisted orbital integral to an ordinary orbital integral. OK, so this twisted orbital integral is actually equal to the orbital integral of um, uh, over the, the orbit of gamma s 
of the base of this base change applied to this function f mu s. Okay, so this this base change is a function from the spherical Hecker algebra uh, to f uh, of g over f to the spherical Hecker algebra of g over h1. So this is now a function in the spherical Hecker algebra for, for g of f. Okay, and you, now you're taking an ordinary orbital integral, but in fact, in this in this case, this becomes much some, something much simpler because this gamma s under our assumptions is actually equal to the identity. Okay, uh, so actually from now on we're, we're always assuming s naught divides s. Okay, so this is actually equal to the identity, which means that this orbital integral is just evaluation of this base change function at the identity identity element. Okay. So the key is to really understand the, the base change of this function. So uh, I want to make a, uh, so H, HS is this is the spherical Hecker algebra for G of FS, and H1 is just where you set S equals 1. So it's a spherical Hecker algebra for G of F. Um, in this case, this fundamental lemma is, is it true? Oh, no, so I was. Yeah. Uh, it's, so it's, uh, it's due to Clozel and, Le and Lebesse. And so, uh, the, so it, it actually only holds for periodic fields. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a remark about this in a, in a moment. Okay, so it actually uses some form of the trace formula. Okay. Uh, so the remark is that, uh, first of all, this is mainly for experts, which is that the stability is OK. So normally, when you, compare, uh, these, when you compare orbital integrals in these fundamental lemmas, you actually take a stable orbital integral and a stable twisted orbital integral. So in this case, the, uh, the, stable, twisted, the stable orbital integral is actually just an orbital integral, because this is this is the identity element, so there's only one stable consciously class. And you can show that all the other uh, stable twisted consciously classes don't actually contribute anything. So the stability is OK. And the second remark is that this base change fundamental lemma is um, only known for periodic fields. OK, so as I said, uh, the proof actually uses some global methods. It uses some form of the trace formula. So we can only apply it to, to periodic fields. But you can actually show that you can show the truth. This is an old case of this fundamental lemma. This is what a simple version. When is this one? Uh, in 80s? 80s? Yeah, 90s. OK. So you can show the truth. Sorry. I think it's based on a simple. Right. I was doing a bunch of cases. Before the gap, right? Yes, yes. Right. OK. Uh, so, so you can actually show that the truth of the conjecture is independent of the characteristic of the ground field. So what do I mean by this? So you can show that actually the truth of, conject the, truth of the conjecture only depends on the affine root system associated with the group G. OK, so if, you, if you're only interested in the case of function fields, um, if you, start off, you, can, you can start off with a group over a function field and always construct a group over a periodic field with the same affine root system, which is just some combinatorial datum. And then you can apply what we're going to do to that case. So this is actually, I think, quite an interesting feature of this approach, where we actually end up using analytic methods for periodic fields to deduce some geometric result for function fields. So this is like the opposite direction. So the information flow is sort of in the opposite direction or what people usually do. So I think a lot of the motivation of, uh, behind this work of Zhu and Bart Schultz to construct all these objects in mixed characteristic was so that you can apply geometric ideas to prove analytic and ar arithmetic results in, in the periodic case, but in the opposite direction. Okay. Can you say again how you, how you do it? So how, huh? how you do it for function fields out of periodic fields? Yeah, so you can show that basically, uh, so in this conjecture, uh, which I, yes, this conjecture, both sides only depend on combinatorial datum. So 
you can show this side only depends on the affine root system, this side only depends on the affine root system. Isn't that asymptotic? It's an identity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this, this conjecture. Yeah. <coughs> um, OK. So now uh, I can talk about how we, so as I said, the key now is to understand this uh, base change function. And we do this using the Sataki transform. Um, so the Sataki isomorphism is an isomorphism between the spherical Hecker algebra, HS, with this uh, group algebra, uh, the vial invariance of the group algebra for the co-weights of the torus, okay, where W0 is the vial group. And this is really quite interesting because basically this, this isomorphism ex explicates the structure of this spherical Hecker algebra. So this, this Hecker algebra is defined as some like functions on this locally compact group, and the algebra structure is given by convolution, so it can be very complicated in general. But this isomorphism says, as is actually very simple to understand, it's just the vial invariance of, certain, of a certain group algebra. And in fact, you can show it's actually a polynomial, polynomial ring. Okay? So turns out there's this commutative diagram. So I insert, so on the bottom, I can insert the spherical Hecker algebra for G of F. And again, this is isomorphic to the vial invariance of this group algebra. And then I can insert. The, on the vertical um, arrows, I have the base change maps. And so the point is, the base change map is very easy to compute on the right-hand side. OK. So the point is, there are two, two bases of This, uh, this group algebra, and they're both indexed by the same set. So they're indexed by, they're naturally indexed by the dominant co-weights. And uh, so the first basis is the Sataki transform of these indicator functions, f mu s, uh, which I'll abuse notation and just write as f mu s. And there's also, on this side, a very natural basis given by these m mu's, which are the sum over lambda in the vial orbit of mu of e to the lambda. So here I'm using exponential notation for this group algebra. So <coughs> uh, this e to the lambda is just the element corresponding to this co weight lambda. And then when I take the vol, the vol orbit, the sum over the vol orbit is actually contained in the, the vol invariance. Okay. So the upshot is that this base change is actually very easy to compute with, with respect to this m mu basis. So you, you can actually show that the base change of m mu is just equal to m s mu. So you just multiply the co-character by s and then take, take the vol invariance, uh, the vol orbit. Okay. So what you can try and do is to actually compute this base change function this, by going along the diagram like this. Okay. Okay. So then we show that, in fact, this twisted orbital integral is actually asymptotically equal to the twisted orbital integral of this function chi mu um, times by a certain weighting factor. So this is q to the s mu rho. OK, so this chi mu. is the character of the highest weight representation v mu. Okay? So this, this character, so I, I'm sort of abusing notation and. Sorry? What's going into 
infinity. S. S is going to infinity. Okay. Yes. Yes. So Q is always Q is always fixed. So where does the as as S goes to infinity. I mean, where does the C S form? Where does the so the S is here? Right? No, no. Why is the asymptotic term appears in this? Uh, why why the? Why is it only an asymptotic? Uh. So oh, there there was yeah. Other terms. Yeah, there are the smaller terms. I mean, so this, this f mu s is not actually equal to the chi, to chi mu. Well, you could also have q to the biggest power there, right? Uh, yeah, anyway, I know. OK. Um, so uh, chi, chi mu is the, is the, so chi mu is the character of, chi, of v mu. Um, so this chi mu, actually, you can write it very easily in this basis m s mu. So, what you do is you can actually, so you apply the base chain fundamental lemma to this. Then you get, this is actually equal to q to the mu rho times the base change of chi mu evalu evaluated at 1. But now I can just write this chi mu in terms of uh, the weight spaces. So this is just going to be the sum of lambda less than or equal to mu of dim v mu lambda, OK? And then I apply the base change to each of the individual terms. So then you just get ms lambda evaluated at 1, OK? So now it looks like we may be getting somewhere. We actually see the, like, the dimension of the weight space appearing, OK? So the key then is to actually compute the asymptotic of these ms lambda 1s. So I think in the literature, these ms lambda 1s, they're actually um, computed, sort of denoted frac m 0 q inverse. Okay, so these, it turns out these objects, so this is actually just uh, a certain coefficient for the inverse of the Satake transform. So they actually have an interpretation in terms of, so they're related to kajdan lustig polynomials. In fact, it's just going to be a sum of, certain sum of kajdan lustig polynomials. And it's known by the cartel lustig formula that these kajdan lustig polynomials have like a con concrete combinatorial description in terms of this Q analog of Costan's co partition function. So it's just some combinatorial gadget. Okay? So in general, these, these polynomials are actually very difficult to compute. But we're actually doing something a little bit different. So normally, when you take asymptotics, as Peter said, you let Q go to infinity. But we're, we're really letting this, we're really letting. You are the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, so we're actually letting this, this s go to infinity. So we're letting this parameter of the co-weight actually go into infinity. And in that case, there is actually some way to, to compute these guys. Um, so the key computation that we do is to show that uh, for lambda not equal to lambda b plus, so lambda b plus is the dominant representative of lambda b that um, this uh, q to the mu rho frac m s lambda 0 q inverse is equal to little o of q to the sd. Okay. And so this is actually, this is, this is the point where we assume it's not type A. Um, so, so sort of the idea behind this computation is that um, Basically, these, these, the degrees of these polynomials, as lambda, uh, it get, the degree of these polynomials becomes smaller as lambda is further away from zero. And so this lambda b plus is actually the closest co-weight to zero. And you can show that in the non-type a case, like a trivial bound in the degrees already show that these other lambdas won't contribute. How do you uh, know there's one close? Huh? Uh, also in your other definition, you said it's kind of the integral yeah. closest. Yeah. You could imagine that there's a tie. Yeah, I, th I think in type A you can get more than one. Tie. But in, in general, I think this is. Well, at least if there's more than one, they should be in like the vol orbit, maybe. You should know the answer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In general, you, you can really you can really bound the disk. You can. I mean, we actually just compute it like case by case in the root system, and then you can show it's like. Uh, 
yeah, we just do this case by case. So we didn't consider type A, but. Um, OK. Uh, so, so in the type A case, we actually did some like calculations on, on the computers. And we actually showed, we can actually, what actually happens in that case is that there's, some cancel, there's actually some cancellation property with these polynomials. So you do actually get the right degree. But to prove it, you have to do some quite difficult combinatorics, I think. Um, so, OK, so then finally, um, we obtain this, this equation, which is that uh, uh, this sum uh, over the, the orbits of the irreducible components of uh, q to the sd divided by the volume. Yeah. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. We. Yeah. We didn't. We didn't care about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. Um, um, okay. So. So then, um, applying this computation, we actually get this equality or, or this asymptotic. Uh, Q the mu rho m s lambda zero q inverse. Okay, so to finish off the proof, we actually have to understand. Yeah, some, uh, sorry. Uh, oh s s is that is that the complaint? Uh, that's bleeding. And that is a frac um sub s lambda b. S oh lambda b yeah. yes it's thanks. Yes, lambda b plus. Thank you. Um, lambda b. OK. Thank you. Um, so then to actually finish off the proof, we actually have to obtain some information about these, these stabilizers. So this is the second step that I mentioned earlier. And to do this, uh, we show the following. So we show that uh, there exists R of t, a rational function with coefficients in z such that, uh, which only depends on the affine root system of g, such that, one, this, if you plug in q, for t, then r of q is equal to this, the left-hand side of this equation. Okay, and secondly, that r of zero is equal to one. Okay, so you can, the idea is you can show abstractly using some sort of Delin reduction method, Delin Lustig reduction method, that the stabilizer is actually a parahoric, and then the volume of a parahoric is essentially counting points in some finite flag variety. And that's a completely combinatorial gadget, which only depends on the root system. Um, so th that's, what, what, that's where this comes from. Okay. Um, so this part works in that page as well. This, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that part works, yeah. OK, so now, uh, so this is, this is nice because this means, in principle, um, since this guy is a rational function, it's actually determined by infinitely many values of q. So we can basically vary the ground field, but, keeping, but keep the affine root system the same. And this determines this rational function. So in principle, it determines the value at 0. Okay. <coughs> so this r of q. We compute to be the, the dimension of v mu uh, lambda b times uh, q to the uh, half defect g. Sorry, uh, it's a limit. The limit as s goes to infinity of q uh, to the half defect g. Okay, so. I basically divided by q to the sd and used the dimension formula to get this defect term here. 
and times by ms lambda naught q inverse. OK? So we really want to basically try and understand this. OK, so it turns out in a lot of cases, we can actually just compute this completely directly. But in general, we have to use sort of a trick. So the trick is the following. So you can actually, you see that actually this, oh, it's a lambda b again here. So you see actually that the term mu doesn't actually appear in this limit, in this expression. So what you can try and do is like change the mu to like certain known cases of the conjecture to deduce this, to deduce what this rational function is. So you can show that this limit is actually equal to um, s of q, where s of t uh, is some rational function, and such that it only depends on the root system again, and also such that s of 0 equals 1. So for this, we use the previous cases. So use the case, for example, mu equals lambda b plus to deduce that case. So in, in this case, the conjecture is known, and you can use the geometry to deduce this, this asymptotic. And then finally, we do this weird thing where now we can set p equal to, to 0. And we get that r of 0 is actually equal to the dimension of uh, b mu lambda b. And, uh, huh? Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh my god. I'm sorry. Uh, that was meant to be like a grand finish, and it didn't really work out. So this is actually equal to <laughs> this is actually equal to the, um, the the just the number of components. Basically, the the idea is for each for each stabilizer, it's going to correspond it, for each irreducible component, it's going to contribute one to this to this uh, to this constant coefficient. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 